All right, so the idea for this video today came actually from Patrick Bet David's podcast. Um, the link actually to the video will actually be down below. But uh, if you don't know who Patrick Bet David is, I uh, strongly recommend you checking out his uh, his content. Um, he's got a YouTube channel. He's, he's pretty much all over social media. Um, just some really awesome uh, content around like business, about uh, entrepreneurship, about leadership, about sales. I mean, just about everything. Again, I'll put all the links down in the description. But you know, recently on a podcast that he had, um, kind of raised the the question. Um, which we'll talk about today, and really kind of propose the question as far as the likelihood of an empire, or, or in this case, America falling and failing. You know, Patrick, uh, but David, he actually proclaims that the likelihood is really uh, for any empire, any state, any country um, declining into extinction, extinction, so to speak, is really inevitable. I mean, this is a pretty bold statement. I mean, to think that, a, the, you know, that America could eventually decline into obscurity after all the great that is done for the world, I mean, that, that's a pretty bold statement. Now, you know, he actually, you know, kind of posits really kind of eight different um, kind of key points that him and his team there kind of come up with as far as why and how America would, would kind of fail. And the first one is naivety. Now, that's kind of like it really, you know, it's citizens really not really understanding kind of what's going on and really not taking an active role into you know, it's prosperity. You know, the other one is, you know, that people in general usually put too much faith into a single person and or a single political party. You know, uh, if you're in the Trump team, you know, you're all Trump and everything else is bad. If you're Biden, you know, he's the guy and everything else is bad. And, and I feel like that is pretty true. I mean, like, you know, I think our country is really dividing depending on political parties and, you know, and the other two can't really co-mingle. And that's kind of a sad state. You know, there is a great thing that we do have, and that's the checks and balances here in, in the country, um, which I think is one of the strong suits of America. But even that is starting to merge and, and kind of collapse on itself. The other ones, you know, overspending and lack of fiscal policy. You know, he kind of points out in his video, you know, if a person's making $40,000 a year and then carrying a $400,000 credit card balance, that's unsustainable. And really, when you look at our national debt, I mean... We're talking about trillions of dollars already passed, talking about trillions more. I mean, eventually, you know, we are going to print ourselves into hyperinflation. And frankly, no country ever really rebounds from that. Now, the next one is kind of war, and that's kind of any kind of war. And then maybe there's some type of invasion. Um, but the next point he has is kind of really like a spirit of division within a nation. Again, we could talk about this along political um kind of aspects we could talk about you know race and gender and really there are so many different avenues that we can find that could unite us but there are so many different facets that we can look at that simply continue to divide us and i think that's really happening here i mean in america quite i mean every day there's there's something on tv and, and on social media and in the news that you could look at as divisive and, and kind of pulling the country apart and the, the other one that he says um you know kind of when a country starts looking at you know, entertainment more over than education. You know, actually his podcast is called, you know, Valuetainment. And I think that's a great thing because there is value to the things he talks about. There's value to the things that he kind of brings up, but it's still entertaining and it's still great. And, and that, so I think that's kind of a great place where you can kind of merge the two. But frankly, you know, when you look at, you know, the Dancing with Stars or whatever popular TV shows there are these days, sorry, I don't really watch too much. Um, but, you know, those get more views than does a political, you know, the presidential debates right? and or anything else that'd be kind of educational. You know, we value entertainment and that's OK, but it's not great. Right. And the last one he kind of talks about is, is a country's kind of losing its country's morals and its values and principles. You know, we can go back to the founding where it was, you know, kind of came about the country kind of came about based on certain values and certain kind of morals. And now how that is either eroding or maybe, depending on your point of view, shifting to a better thing, um, there's still some declining in, in morals, I think, in, in America. Now, I mean, these are all great reasons why a country could fail and really kind of decline into obscurity. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to introduce you to someone. Uh, you, maybe you've heard of him, maybe not. But, um, you know, I think he's got some great talking points. His name is Alexander Fraser Titler. So Alexander Fraser Titler was born in 1747, died in 1813, so been gone for quite some time. He was a Scottish judge, a writer, historian, 
professor at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and he actually had the sweet title of Lord Woodless or Woodhouse Lee, I guess. I don't know how you say it, but, but yeah, I think it's a pretty cool title anyways. But one of the things that Titler's most famous for is writing this thing is what we've called today the life cycle of democracy or Titler's life cycle of democracy. Now, this is also attributed to Alexis de, I'm going to ruin this last name, sorry, uh, Tocqueville, uh, maybe, he's French, I don't know, uh, but he was a French aristocrat, he was a diplomat, you know, political scientist, political philosopher, historian, I mean, either way, whether it's him or Titler, you know, I first learned it as a Titler cycle, so we'll just stick to that, but Titler back in 1787 wrote this, a democracy is always temporary by nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until that time when the voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority will always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. Titler kind of continues here. Uh, the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from beginning of history has been about 200 years. And during those 200 years, these nations always progress through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence back into bondage. It's a pretty powerful statement when you think about it. You know, I mean, the natural tendency for a country to really kind of go about, you have this place of bondage to then this great kind of upheaval. And now we're, we're courageous. Now we're free. And then because of our freeness and because of our you know prosperity, then we kind of slowly, really not because of an outside source, but typically from internal reasons, we kind of slowly progress back into bondage. Um, Again, pretty powerful statement, but, you know, let, let's take a deeper uh, deeper dive into these different stages. And, and, you know, for this conversation, we'll use the context of America, but you, know, you could really kind of insert any country, nation um, in the past or now and, and kind of have a quick formula to see, you know, kind of a common sense calculation of where we stand. So back under the helm of King George III, who obviously had some amazing fashion sense about him, uh, but he continued to expand England's reach around the globe through colonization. You know, many felt that the policies of the crown um, was extreme, and many sought out new lands. You know, they went to go to these colonies and so forth, and many of them, the draw was just spiritual in nature. It was, you know, really the first shift that we saw, and that was from the bondage to spiritual faith and growth. And then after years of oppression, many here in the U.S. colonies felt a strong desire to break free. And really, that was a break free of the financial chains of the crown. And now we're often taught that the Boston Massacre of 19, uh, excuse me, 1770 uh, was a tipping point that would eventually lead to the creation of the Boston Tea Party in 1773. You know, Patrick Henry gives his famous liberty or death speech in Richmond um, back in 1775. And finally, Paul Revere and William Dowles go take their horses out for a midnight ride. Now, the American colonies at this point rely on their great courage and belief in freedoms to the point where they're actually willing to fight against a global superpower. Then after some battles in Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill, uh, what we now call is the Revolutionary War kicks off. Thomas Paine publishes his Common Sense pamphlet in 1776. And after a bloody six years of battle, General Cornwallis finally officially surrenders in Yorktown. And then again, we call this today the Revolutionary War, and it's finally ended at that surrender. And now we have the stage of shifting from courage, great courage, to now liberty. You know, we elected General uh, George Washington as our first president. We passed the Bill of Rights. We expanded to the West, the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S.-Mexican War, you know, the gold rush of the 49. 49ers is where the name comes from, and the continued desire to expand west, and ultimately this brought about a bloody war, which we again call the Civil War, and now we have continuing liberty, um, which achieved for all people, and that's by the emancipation of the dreadful practice today of slavery. Now, before I go on, I think it's important to really highlight just how vital our alliances were in proving winning the war. Um, going back to the Revolutionary War, you know, in large part, America would not have come to fruition without, uh, and to the point to where we know it is today, without France. I mean, frankly, providing a bulk money for troops and armament, and military leadership and naval support. 
Um, you know, I'll put the link down in the description to an actual great article that does point out some key points of how France really helped us out. But they weren't alone. Spain had a great, you know, a great, really supportive role in, in our freedoms. And so did the Netherlands, you know. Again, people that we don't really talk about them too much, but you know, without them, they really could not, or excuse me, we as, a, as America really could not have come to become the country that we are today. And so we have this relatively young country. You know, the United States of America really entered into the next stage, and that's abundance. You know, we have the Transcontinental Railroad that was executed and, you know, planned and executed on. You know, we, we built the first airplane. We built the first automobile. You know, and, and as these technological and industrial events started happening, we continued to grow, you know, prosperity-wise. You know, we, we really kind of also started looking at the social aspects of things. You know, Social Security was passed. You know, we had the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And so here we are as a country growing not just industrially, um, but also socially as well. You know, and I think at this point, this kind of work gets a little controversial, right? I mean, you see up to this point in our history, we can think of all the, and I think we could all kind of agree on the assessment that we've done so far. You know, America was doing quite well for most. And for most, America was still seen as a shining light on the hill, to, to quote somebody, right? You know, and as Emma Lazarus was quoted on the inscription of the Statue of Liberty, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And I think that's how a lot of, not just Americans, but a lot of international people, when they were coming and migrants as they came to America, saw America. And yet, you know, every nation, as with all the ones before us, our decline still imminent. You know, some will argue that we're still living in the abundance stage. You know, some argue that we've progressed into complacency or even apathy, or even some argue that we're even in dependence stage right now. And again, going back to this is kind of the controversial part. You know, some point out that the large social welfare, uh, welfare and vast safety nets that are afforded to our citizens, and even those who are not fully legal citizens yet, is evidence that we're already beyond apathy and living in dependence you know, and quickly progressing back into bondage. While others point out that the ability to provide such resources and to some voices, you know, not providing enough social welfare, that we're still kind of in that abundance stage. You know, I mean, whatever your feeling is, I think we could all agree on the following. And that is, you know, this July will mark the 245th birthday for America. Um, and I think for most democracies to simply last beyond 200 years, according to Titler, um, We've had an amazing run. You know, America has and will continue to do for many years down the road, do some amazing things in the world. And there's never been a country or, or a station, you know, a, a nationhood that's done so much good around the world. And I think that's something to, to think about. You know, while there are things that America struggles in, and while there are some things that still today um, I think can be better in America, I don't think anybody can argue that there's been never been a country in the history of the world that's ever done such good for the rest of the world. And, you know, so I'd love to hear what you guys think. You know, I mean, what do you think? I mean, if you had to look at America, you know, and put itself somewhere on the Titler cycle, I mean, where do you think that would be? I mean, I'd love to hear back from you guys and see what you guys think. But as always, best wishes to you and yours. Be awesome. Take care.